Okay, the presentation today is What Does God Think? You may wonder why the title is like that, but the reason is we need to know what he thinks instead of what man thinks. You know, sometimes people say, oh, what am I going to dress today? What am I going to use today? What am I going to do? People wonder what they should be doing. Or people sometimes say, should have done what is right? And where do we look for approval? Most of the time to people, right? We want to know what our parents think, what our friends think most of the time. But how many times do we say, what does God think? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So God has a thought for us. He's thinking about us. He had something in mind. Do you know what is that that He's thinking about you? Now the reason I name it also like this in our presentation is because as parents we want to know what God thinks in everything that we do for our children. So let's start. This one I have made it by God's grace as a presentation, a practical way. Meaning we are going to have questions and answers that we have in the real life. And you will see that you are involved in the questions and the answers because that's most of the time what happens in our society. So let's start with the first question. This is real life. Imagine a father and a mother. They have one or two children, let's say. And they want to go, let's say, out because they have a meeting. Question. Who is the right person to take care of your child when you are going out? Have you seen this happening in house? <laughs> Some of you laugh because it's reality, right? This is real life. We are not talking about nonsense. This is real life. This is what happens to every marriage. There must be one time that you are thinking, I want to go out with my wife somewhere, or she says, I want to go somewhere with my husband, but I need to have my children with somebody. Do you have heard those things? You have faced them? Okay, the two options that I give you one right now is this. Number one is the best friend. That's the person that you may have in mind. The second option is who? Grandmother or sister. Now, in the U.S., most of the time, the option that people have is number one. Why? Because normally people, when they are 18 years old, they go to boarding school. They don't see their parents anymore, mostly. Even they get married and the parents don't know. So where are the grandparents? Who knows where they are? So when they have a child, who is the one who take care of, takes care of them? A friend. Or someone that they pay to take care of what they call a nanai, right? Now, in the Philippines, it's not so. Who is the one to take care of the child? Lola, right? Grandma, as most of the time, is the most common answer. Now, question is, this is society. This is what we have learned, this is what we see. This is the reality, real world. The question will be, what does God think? <clears throat> so I ask you, do you know what God thinks about that? You want to see it? Let's see it. Huh? Okay. It says there, Be careful how you relinquish the government of your children to others. How many people? What does he say? No one. How many? No one can properly relieve you of your God-given responsibility. Now, I continue saying, Many children have been utterly ruined. Do you know what ruin means? By the interference of relatives or friends in their home government. What an interesting thought. This is God speaking. Now let's continue reading so we can see. Mothers should what? Never. How many times? 
Mothers should never allow their sisters or Lolas, of course, right? To interfere with the wise management of their children. Now, let me tell you my personal experience so you can understand. In my home, one of my first rules, one of my first rules is my children can never be far from my sight or my hearing. If I am not there, I'm number one, huh? I'm the father. If I am not there, they should be close to my wife's sight or hearing sight. Now, I'll tell you why. Now, I obey that even though I have passed this testimony that I'm going to give you. Not be, I'm not obeying God because I ha happen to have this to me. I just had that since ever I know it. When I read these things and I knew the truth, I had my law made. Even before my queen, I met her. So the point is, one day I was walking, even at Uchi Pines Institute in Alabama. And I was walking, and it happened that I had a friend who was an American, U.S. born, and he had married a Filipino lady. Nothing against anybody that from the Philippines. This happens all over the world. I'm just saying the experience that I had, right? And I was walking with my two children, and they went forward towards us, and then we greet each other, and when we greet each other, she squat, you know, and started talking to my children. And she said something I could hear, and I told my children, don't do that. And even the husband said, why do you say that? Don't say that to the children. And you will see it later. Why am I saying this? We have to be careful what happened. What seed is planted in the ears of your children? What seed is planted in the side of our children? Everything we have to be on guard. And it says there, many children have been utterly ruined by the interference of relatives or friends in their home government. Mothers should never allow their sisters or mothers to interfere with the wise management of the children. Continue saying, though the mother may have received the very best training at the hands of her mother, yet, in nine cases out of ten, how much is that? Mathematic, 90%. 90% of the time, what does God say? 90% of the time, God is saying, what? As a grandmother, she will what? Spoil her daughter's children. It doesn't say grandfather. It says grandmother. Wait. Don't go too far so soon. <laughs> but what does it say? The most important here says it will spoil, she will spoil the grandchildren. This is the reality. This is God speaking. This is a true story. We see it over and over. Now let me open your eyes to something very important. Because the important thing is not that Lola has damaged the children. No, that's not the important thing. The important thing is how it happens. And God is saying how. What are the two tools that Satan uses to spoil children? Did you get it already from the paragraph? Let's keep reading. All, no. It says, she will spoil her daughter's children by what? Indulgence, number one, and injudicious praises. So now let's open up this so we can see reality, okay? What is indulgence? What is indulgence? <clears throat> it's when you give up a principle for something you desire. Something you have in your nature, you want, and you give up. There is actually many, many companies today in the world that they call their products temptation, indulge, indulge, things like that. Why? Because they know 
For Satan knows that he can control us for the things that are in our nature. Now let me give you an example so you can see. In my house, there is a rule. My children will never eat in between meals, right? Mm -hmm. If I go to my home, my parents' home, and I allow my children to go with my mother or my father, and by the way, going somewhere, my children eat something in between meals. My parents have just taught my children to disobey the Father in heaven. One step and another one is done every moment to a route that will take our children to hell. One step at a time. Nobody knows the rules of a home except mother and father. So there is no one that can properly relieve you of your God-given responsibility. Now people may say, Doc, what happened with people that lose their parents, the father and the mother? Well, things may happen and you may have a plan B now. There are emergency situations that could come. There may be emergency situations that can come, but you should not use these excuses to relieve yourself of your God-given responsibility. Why? Let me give you an example. One day we had Kevin, and then Kayla was coming on the way, and she needed to be delivered. So, we called the hospital that was assigned to us. We talked with them because we were looking for options where to have Kayla. And then we talk over this, and we talk, and we talk, and we talk, and we call the hospital, and we said, we need to have our baby with us, Kevin, in the hospital, at the place where we are going to have the delivery. Do you have a place for him? Do you have a room that we can have? Do you have a space for a crib that we can take? And they said, sure, we have a, a room. It's a private room. We can have it with you. We can have the baby there, and he can be delivered there. In the U.S., you don't have many options for these things. Because we didn't have where to put Kevin when Kayla was going to be born. So I said, okay, I will go. So we got that. We took Kevin with us to the hospital. We got the crib and everything, and we put him in the room with us. And my plan was to change the crib to this CR area, which was very big, whenever the right moment was going to come. If it was night, I would put the crib in the bathing area, in the CR area, which was very big, and let him sleep in that section. That was the plan. We pick up now from the reading, and it says, Though the mother may have received the very best training at the hands of her mother, yet in nine cases out of ten, as a grandmother, she would what? Spoil her daughter's children. By what? Indulgence and injudicious praise. Indulgence, we said, then is something that we can give up, a principle so we can obtain from our nature, something we desire, but it may not be good. Now the idea is, I was telling you that one example would be, like if my children don't know, I mean, don't, are not allowed at home to eat anything in between meals, and I go to my parents' house and let's say they give them something to eat, they will have been learning disobedience to the Father in heaven because they have learned disobedience to the Father on earth. Remember, this is also the basics of the two life story problem that we have in the youth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why? Because we will learn that we can have two lives. You can have one life with some people doing what you should not be doing and another life with Jesus anytime you want. You see the problematic now? The next one says there, injudicious praises. Now for this one, I'm going to explain a little bit before so we can go into it. Injudicious praises may be many things, but I'll give you two that you may recognize, but I want you to think about it because we cannot pass by. Look, this is the problem. We see these things in society. We see the problem in society, but we are embedded in it that we cannot see it. You see the point? Give you an example. <clears throat> you remember the story of Anna and Elkanah. 
Who are they? The parents of Samuel. He was a prophet. Of course, when he was born, he was not a prophet. But they were the parents of Samuel, the prophet. Now, was she a pious woman? What about him? What was Elkanah? Do you know? He was a priest. He was a priest. He used to serve in the priesthood. He used to come to the sanctuary and work for the Lord as a priest. We will say today that's kind of a pastor, right? So you have that picture in the mind? Now let me ask you a question. How many wives did Elkanah have? Two? Are you sure? You're telling me that someone that was working for God, similar to a pastor, was having two wives? What? What will we say if we allow pastor, whoever, I'm not going to take anybody's name, to come here and work for us and he has two wives? What would you say about that? Is that right? Question. Was it right then? Was it right at the time of Elkanah to have two wives? Oh. So if it wasn't not right then and not today, why did he have two? You see that? Now, let me put it this way in a real conclusion. There are things in our life today that are not good. But we see it as what? Normal. Normal. Everybody does it. Does it mean it's good? No. Oh. The reason Elkanah had two wives, says the Spirit of Prophecy, is because it was so common that nobody saw it as a sin. Is there anything right now in my life that I'm doing that is normal? It is not sin. Yet, in the eyes of the Lord, it is wrong. Do you know of anything? Well, let me tell you, you will not know because that's the reason. It's not known. It's blind in our eyes. We cannot see it. It's normal. It's not sin. Now I'll give you the two ways of most common injudicious praises. We do it, we don't see it, we don't think about it, yet it is Satan's work. Number one, is this real story, real life? You may have seen it, we have heard it maybe. You may have even said it today. But let me tell you, this is the truth. Don't feel bad about it. The only thing is now you are going to be open to your eyes and you are not going to be doing it again. Please, don't do it again. You are damaging children when you do this. And this is it. Number one, somebody comes and I walk in with my children or you are walking with your children and somebody comes to the children, squat down and they said, Oh, you are adorable. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that before? That is an injudicious praise. And this is the way pride grows in the heart of our children. And Satan uses that seed that was planted in Satan's heart in heaven. Next one. Oh, you are so cute. Brothers and sisters, this is the reality. Pay attention, think about it, study yourself, and you will see how many bad things God has to say about these two phrases. You study. Look for it. And this is just two examples. I'm not giving you all things. Mothers, grandmothers, 
People, I myself used to maybe even said it before, but I did not know. Does that mean it's a good thing? No, it's not. Who is the only one adorable? Who is it? God. Should we adore a child? Should we render homage and honor to a child? No. What does God have to say about children's attention? You want to know? Let's know. Let's get it. We'll get there. All the patient effort of the mother may be undone by this course of treatment. It is proverbial that grandparents... Now grandfather is coming in the picture, right? Remember I told you, don't, don't get there too far. Grandma, yes, but grandfather also. It's proverbial that grandparents, as a rule, what happened? Are unfit to bring up their grandchildren. Now let me ask you a question. In this world that we have today, you see the picture. We have a marriage, husband and wife. They get separated because they have divorce. The mother takes the children and she goes to live with grandma. And she has to work to get food for those children. Grandma takes care of them. And what does God say about that? You see the picture now? Can you see why our society is drifting away from God? Because God's way, he says, that's not the way. The way is the father to be in the home. Yet, what Satan has done? Because he knows what's the next step. Go to Lola and live with her. And then he knows what's the next step. You have to work to get food for those children. And he knows what's the next step. Lola is going to take care of them. And he knows what's the next step. They are going to be spoiled. And he knows what's the next step. Our society is messed up. And the church is unhealthy. Can you see that now? Now let's continue reading. Men and women should pay all the respect and deference due to their parents. My own example. I went to Panama, to my country, and I visited my parents. And then one day, my father said, I'm going to take Kevin to the market. And I said, sorry, father. All the respect to my father, I love him, and I respect him, and I obey him. Gladly, always. Well, maybe not always. When I was a child, I had to be spanked sometimes, too. But anyhow, the point is that I do it. Thank God for his willing heart and though. But when he said so, I said, sorry, father. My rule in my home is this. My children cannot be far from my sight or my hearing. Either I go with them, with you, or my queen goes with you and with them. So he did not go. I was busy with something else, and thank God my father respected. If he would not have, what a terrible thing. Because if there is one thing that damaged a child, is the grandpa fighting the rule of the father. Don't allow that your children will see that. That damage the rule, the view of the Heavenly Father. No one should question the government of God. And if your children see that someone questions your authority, that is very detrimental for their spiritual life. So it says there, we should do their respect to the parents, should pay all the respect and deference due to their parents, but in the matter of the management of their own children, they should allow what? No interference, but hold the reins of government in their own hands. Can you see this? Is this what we do in society? Do we know true education? Remember, I learned these things before I married. And I determined in my heart I'm going to do what God says. Is it easy? No. You know already that it's not easy. What will, you, what will you face if you tell your parents, my children are not going with you today, alone? What will you face? 
Can you imagine that? I have to be there. One day a lady in the church wanted to take Kevin in her, in her arms and I gave Kevin to her arms and she was holding because you know people like children, right? And then she ran. And I run behind her. Why? That's the rule. He was not even walking. He was a small. You think I was going to leave him alone? No. I will never allow my children to be in a temptation they cannot stand. Why? Why? The spiritual aspect here is the most important. Do you think God allows you to go through a temptation you cannot stand? When you do that to your children, we are responsible for that as parents. Because God does not do that to us. Let's keep going. Many things in the home that we do, many things in our society, we do. But are they really right? What does God think about it? Do you want to know what people say? What people do in society? You know it already. I want to know what God thinks about it. So real life question. Which is the right question when your child is eating? So lunch is coming and people ask, number one, what would you like to eat? Is that a good question? Option one. Option two, would you like more food? Which is the right answer when children are eating? Which is the right option? The question one or the question two? Who is for question one? I mean option one. Who is for option two? Okay, some people. Honest. Honesty, because this is what we see in society, right? This is honesty. Okay, no problem. We are not saying, even today, I'm not saying you are wrong and I'm right. No, that's not the point. The point here is that I have born in, born in the same place like you, this earth. We have been raised in the same society. But I chose in one day, when I learned God's word, I must be different, a peculiar people, a holy nation, right? And he says that. <clears throat> what does God think? He says, teach them to deny appetite, to be grateful for the Doritos, for the peanut roasted with garlic and MSG, with the is that what it says? With the candies that they sell in the corner store. Is that what it says? No, it says teach them what? To be grateful for the plain, simple diet God gives them. Did God give us any of those chicherias that you see in the store? Well, let me tell you what I do. I never, 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 never buy it. And I never give it to my children. Why? Because God's command is this. Make sure you teach your children to be thankful for simple food. You see the reality, brothers and sisters? And God's word, not mine. What is God saying? Teach your children to be thankful for food that God has given. What is that? An apple, a banana, a mango, a camote, God be, cassava. This is what we eat at home. Sometimes I've been in the 7-Eleven and I see around. If I'm driving and I'm traveling, I cannot eat anything. There's nothing here I can eat. Maybe water. And that's even questioned right now. If we study about the water, we'll have a time. But that's not the point right now. And it says there, It is not for you to allow them to dictate to you what they should eat. Who is the one in your home that says what they eat? In my home, it's me. Mommy prepares the food, or I prepare the food, and I say, this is your plate, this is your plate, this is your plate. You eat it. And they eat it. 
The only question I allow my children to ask is this. May I have more? That's all. They cannot ask, may I have mango? No way. They can ask, may I have more? I give them what they need, not what they want. Who is the one who knows how much carbohydrate? Do you know how much fat should a child eat? Do you know how much protein should every person eat? Do you know how much carbohydrate should every person eat? Now, wait, 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 wait. Now let's go back to one point. This is our problem in our society, and we will be covering this when Sister Teresa talks about the importance of true education and physiology of the body. Because if God is saying, you are the one who needs to determine, we are the ones as parents to know what? How much carbohydrates they need to eat, how much protein they need to eat, and how much calcium, how much we have to know it. Now let me ask you a question. Have you been in that school here? everywhere in the Philippines, anywhere that you have learned that as a father. Have you been in that school anywhere? No. You see the necessity we have in our homes? Now when are you going to learn that? After you married or before you married? You see the need that we have in our society? How many young, yo, youth, how many young people are getting married without having any knowledge of what they have to do? and how to take care of the children. Do we have that knowledge? This is medical missionary work. This is true education. This is the, the knowledge that we are lacking. We don't have it. We become parents and we do not know what to do. But wait, I'll show you. We will show you that this is God's requirement. It's not an option. God is saying you must know these things before you married. If not, you will see how God calls that. How he sees it, not what, how man sees it. How I see it or how my parents see it, how my grandparents see it, is how he sees it. Look at this. It is a what? In the middle of the paragraph. So it says there, it is not for you to allow them to dictate to you what they should eat, but you should dictate what is best for them. It is a sin. How does God call that? A sin. What is sin? Look, let's see here. Keep reading. It is a sin for you to allow your children to murmur. Who is the one in charge of that sin? Guilty of that sin? The children? Who? The parents. If you allow a child to murmur one time, it's your sin. You should, be, you should be in your knees in that evening and ask for forgiveness for that sin. And then beside that, you have to ask the Lord for wisdom because you have to correct that. You cannot allow your child to just murmur when you give him an apple, a banana, and he's asking for Doritos. You see the point here? And this is God's view. This is how God sees it, not me. It says, It is a sin for you to allow your children to murmur and complain about good, wholesome food just because it does not suit their depraved appetite. I was one day in a missionary house. People doing medical missionary work. Right? That's what we think. I'm not criticizing, I'm just telling you the truth, the reality. And I saw the need in the family. The lady, an aunt of a child, was taking care of a child and he came to eat with us because she invited us to eat. So we, we started eating and there was in the plate rice and some things and then the child was eating and I was just paying attention because I want to see how this child is going to get in there. What can I provide for his, these little ones? Because I see the need in the world today. He was eating, and he didn't want to eat much. And then he asked for a banana. Of course, banana is sweeter. It's better than eating a rice, maybe. But they get, the lady gave him a banana. Okay, he gave he got the banana and the plate, and he ate the banana, and he did not want to continue eating the rest of the food. Now, first problem, she gave up. 
She was obedient to the child. She gave the child what she, he wanted. He was not obedient to her. The obedience was that he needed to finish that food first, and then she could have given him something else if she was the one determined. Yet, that does not, that's not the order. The order was, she was obedient to him because he did not finish the food, he did not obey the rule, and he was granted a gift because he disobeyed. You see the point now? He was rewarded for disobeying. You see it now? Can you see it clearly, fathers and mothers? He was rewarded for sinning. Is that how God works? Now we do it today. We do it tomorrow. We do it the next day. We do it the next day. And it becomes a habit. And we, our children, learn to disobey because they will get a reward. Then the child started asking for something else. And the lady brought a cookie box. That child jumped from that chair, went to that box, and was waiting for that cookie. And the lady gave the cookies. He came to the chair and sat down. He finished those cookies, and he was asking for more cookies. Then my work to do, my support to the family. I pray, number one. And I said to the child, look, you still have your banana there. This is God's food for you. It's a gift from God. That's all I said. That was my contribution to the problem. Of course, he did not hear, because I cannot change that heart in one day. I was just passing by. And then, the auntie was not looking at He went around because the auntie put the box higher and he jumped into a chair and he took the box and he went out. The auntie saw him going out with the box. She did not say anything because she was busy with us. Can you see the picture? What do you think God thinks about that auntie at that moment? She neglected the most precious mission field she had in her life. The care of even a nephew, not a son, a nephew. Because the greatest mission field was not the people around in the city. It was not even us having food at that moment. It was that child. Can you see it now, brothers and sisters? Isn't this the reality of this world today? Isn't this the reality? This is the reality. Now tell me, tell me that we have obedient children all over this world today. Huh? Tell me. What do we have? Why? Why is this happening? Because this that God has given us as a manual, people say some days or sometimes, Children do not come with manual. Let me tell you that's not true. God gave us the manuals. The main one is the Bible. And if we are still bad in our minds because our brains are getting dumb with this world of sin up to that, this point right now, God was merciful to give us the spirit of prophecy, all these books, to give us the guidelines. What we need to do as parents every moment, in any case, so we could follow it. But what do we do? We don't have it. We don't pay attention to that as a group. And we don't do it as an individual to take the time, take the effort to see them, read them, learn them, and apply them. Do not let the child receive the impression that because he is your child, he must therefore be deferred to and permit to choose and direct his own way. He should not be permitted to choose articles of food that are not good for him, simple because he likes them. The experience of parents should have a controlling power in the life of the child. Who is the one who should determine what a child eats? 
Therefore, you must know what is good for your children. What will be the allowance? What will be the good amount of fats in one plate for one person? Do you know? Do you know that God says how much? He has said. He says one-sixth of the plate could be fats in our diet. One six of the plate. So if you divide the plate in six parts, one of that could be cassoy nuts. The other one could be rice, the other one could be beans, the other one could be something else. But one six of your child's plate could be cassoys. Now don't ask me how many cassoys and how many spoons. You have to determine that. Your children are different, the plate is different, and the amount they eat is different. But you have a guideline, sure guidelines, you can follow, simple. Have you ever read this? Well, we don't know then how to take care of our children. Let me tell you, I'm not perfect. I don't know everything either. But what I have learned, I will share. What I'm saying is, we have been blind to what society has been teaching us. We don't have the right method. We don't know it. But the guidelines and the methods are here. Are you planning to get married? You should know these things before getting married. If you don't get these things before you get married, it's going to be very hard for you to do it after you marry. I have people that have married and I ask them, do you have time now to read those books? And they said, we don't have time. When I married my queen, and this is reality, nothing to be hidden, this is witnessing. This is our family experience. When we married, of course I told you, I've read the child guidance three times. At the home, two times. Mind, character, and personality, two times, volume one and volume two, two times two. The four books. Beside, you know, one little here, there, youth, uh, messages to young people and so on. And some other books, but the most important ones for me are those for family. And I read them. I purpose in my heart. What about my queen? She read child guidance only portions. When we married, I said, we have to read it together. And we started. We read Adventist Home and we read child guidance. And guess what? When we were going through the reading, she said, I did not know these things. Now you know. My first job when I married my queen was to guide her through the things she needed to learn for our marriage. And this is one responsibility that is very important for men today. We are the priests and we make sure our companion know how to handle the boat also. If she does not ha know how to handle the boat and I have a problem or I am not there, then family will have a problem, right? Now let's see. Next question. What do I do if my baby starts crying? Not a physical need. What do I do if my baby cries? You see, one month old baby. We have a one here. How old, how old is he? One and a half. He still doesn't, is he walking? Not yet, okay. You see, a baby. What do we do when a child cries? Not physical need. Now remember this. When I had Kevin, the first one, I had it clear. God shall supply all our needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. You remember that verse? God does not say, I supply all your wants. You see that? It's clear? So number one, as a rule, parents, we should know what our children need. Okay. So for my children, for my child, he needs to be well fed in his schedules and everything. He needs to have his food well. He needs to be warm, not hot. Warm. He needs to be covered properly. So I learned how to do that. He needs to have his diaper change any time he needs it, right? These are physical needs. What about security and warnings? 
He needs to be off of dangerous things, ants, bees, and whatever you can think, right? Let's say your child starts crying because a bee stung him. What are you going to do? Spank that child because he cried because a bee stung him? No way. That would be something wrong from our part. What about if you forgot to feed your child and time is passing? Look, as I told you, I'm not perfect and it happened to me one time. What did I do? Of course, he doesn't understand me yet. I said, Kevin, forgive me. And I took him for his mother to be fed. Of course, now I have to see how I'm going to do because the schedule is all off now. But I arranged it in a way that we could go back into the horse again. Path again, the right way. It happened to me. I was driving and I did not pay attention. The time has passed. And he started crying. Then I realized, oh, I failed the schedule. This is not what we are talking about. This is something the child does not need. He started crying. He doesn't need food. He's well fed. He doesn't have anything. What do I do? Number one, option. What do you see? You give the breast or bottle and comfort him or her. Have you seen that happening? Okay. <clears throat> Second option. I look for a toy or give him them a pacifier. Straight. I never allow my children to have a pacifier. Never. None of the three. And I never allow them to suck their fingers. Never. And I can go through the whole medical issue and why not and why yes. But that's not the point today. You have to learn yourself why not and what yes. But the point is that the second option, I never had it in my home. Now question, have you seen that happening in this world? Okay, so it happens. How many of you go for the option one? You think that's the right thing to do? Option two. Okay. This is reality. This is honesty. This is what happened in the world today. Now let's see. Do you want to know what God thinks? Let's see it. One precious lesson which the mother will need to repeat again and again is that the child is not to... How many times you should do it, mothers? Again and again and again. You need to let the child know he is not the one to rule. How old can you do it? Anytime, even one day old. You have to let your child know he is not the one to rule. He is not the master, but her will and her wishes are to be supreme. This is God's talking. <clears throat> Thus, she is teaching them what? God is, you are teaching them self-control. <clears throat> How can we teach self-control to a baby like him, two days old? How can we teach them self-control? God says, Give them how much? How much? Give them nothing for which they cry. Even if your tender heart desires ever so much to do this. For if they gain the victory once by crying, they will expect to do it again. The second time, the battle will be more vehement. Do you know that the business of the world is built in this disobedience to God? If I have time, I will show you the clip coming from some of the studies in the United States from psychologists talking about the nagging. Nag you know what nagging is? This is it. Most of the business of the world are based on this disobedience, the nagging effect. But what does God say about that? 
never, never give anything to a child when crying. So one rule in my home was this. When my Kevin was born, I told my queen, and I read it for her, so she know where the principle comes from. You will never give the breast to Kevin when he cries. Only at regular intervals. Why? You want to know. You want to know. We'll see it. Does this really apply to babies? You may have to know that applies for a child maybe five years old, maybe ten years old. No. It applies to babies. Even one day old, two days old. Let's see it. The importance of training children to right dietetic habits can hardly be overestimated. The little ones need to learn that they eat to live and not live to eat. The training should begin with the infant in the... When? The child in her mother's arm. Therefore, yes, it is applicable. It is talking about babies. Now look what it says. The child should be given food only at regular intervals and less frequent at it as it grows older. So the principle is this, established. Two main rules. It has to be regular interval. What does a regular me interval mean? It means a schedule. It means you do it at 7 o'clock every day, you do it at 10 o'clock every day, you do it at some time determined. At that time, not another time. Do we follow that in this world? Is that what we follow mothers? No. This is the reality. This is honesty. I grew up in the same environment, same society problem. Child cries, what does mother do? Give the breast to the child. Don't do that anymore. Now you know. You see how many things in our world we see as normal, like nothing is happening. Yet, God said, don't do it. Is it clear? Did He give us guidelines? Did He say anything about it? It is here. Now the second rule is what? As he grows older, what needs to happen? It needs to be spaced out. Example. So I'll give you an example. If you start with a schedule of a two and a half hours or three hours. So the child eats every two, three hours or two and a half hours. The next meal will be two and a half hours. And when he is growing that you know that he is needing less food at the moment, you have to space it out. You have to change it. If it was three hours, now it's three and a half. It passes few days, few weeks, and now instead of being three and a half hours, it's now four hours. So you want to see an example? We'll see it. It should not be given sweets or the food of older persons which it, it is unable to digest. Care and regularity in the feeding of infants will not only promote health and thus tend to make them... What? what? Do you want a quiet baby? What does God say is the solution, the way to have quiet children? Regularity in the meal. You see now why we have so many children cannot be quiet. You see that? Now this is real testimony. When I had Kevin and we had it in, the, in Guyana in South America, people would come and ask me, does Kevin never cry? And I said, yes, sometimes, when it's needed. But in general, no. But you will see why. I'll explain to you. And it says there, quiet and sweet temper. But we lay the foundation of habits that will be a blessing to them in after years. Mothers, we are building for eternity. And the building starts before the mother's womb. If we have time and talk about our breathing and how the lady is now even 13 years old, 18 years old, your toxins when you don't breathe properly affect your baby when he is going to be born. 
And I can prove you that. Now, this one is an example that happened at LNG Wise time, a real story. We're going to read what LNG Wise said about it. So pay attention to this paragraph. This is a real story. A lady came to her asking what to do. And he says, another woman came running out, a young woman with a babe. How many weeks? Four weeks old. You see, it's a baby. Okay? What does God have to say through the prophet? She needed some counsel because the child could not retain the food from the mother's breast. She will eat and vomit. She will eat and vomit. A few questions were asked. Now Ellen G. White is asking. And she asked, Do you not put your child to the breast whenever it cries? What does that mean? Ellen G. White knew what was the custom of the days. What was the custom of the days? The same one today. The baby cries. What the mother do? Put the baby to the breast. So she was asking to make sure she was following the same thing everybody's doing. Do you not put your child to the breast whenever he cries? She said, she did. And you work hard. This is LNG White now. And you work hard and get tired and then nurse the little one. And the mother said, yes, she did. Then a counsel was given. She said, to observe what? Regular periods, intervals for feeding the baby. Not oftener than two or three hours. Do we follow that? Does God have anything to say about the breastfeeding of our children? It's clear. He gave it to us. How many of us have followed it? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm just saying the reality. This is reality. I know it's a reality. I've been there. I know it. You know it too. And look what it says. The child was stuffed full and it was a mercy that it could throw up that which the stomach could not retain. The mother was not realizing that she was actually almost killing the baby, putting food where there is no space. Can you see that? Okay. There is so great ignorance among mothers as to how to care for the children properly. The mother promised to heed the suggestion. Story finished. What does God say about the mothers today? And that's not only about the mothers. Fa fathers, I can tell you today, there's a lot of ignorance in the parents also. I was there and I said one day, I don't want to be there. I want to make sure when I'm married, I am a good father. I'm not perfect. I'm a human being. I did many mistakes. I've done it and maybe I'm doing it today. And I have to ask the Lord to show me where. But the point, brothers and sisters, is this. There is a way of escape. We have the knowledge. We just have to learn and apply it. If we don't apply it, it's like nothing. I remember one day a teacher told me in one presentation, education means a change of behavior. And I never forget that. You will never be educated unless you change your behavior. You can be instructed, you can listen, you can hear the information, and you were only instructed. So if you listen what I said today, and you never do something different, you were only instructed, you were not educated. The only education happens if there is a movement, if there is a change in our lives. So what do we want to do? Be informed or be educated? Okay. Before I finish, I want to give you the example of what the schedule is so you can have an idea what you are going to be doing when you are teaching mothers in the church. Because I hope you will teach this in the church. Mothers, how to do it, so you can see. So remember the two main principles. It has to be a regular schedule and it has to be separated as the baby grows more. He doesn't need so much food or so often. Now let's say, like Kevin, we started with a two and a half hours period. Two and a half hours. Now let me tell you before I continue, there is a principle in the spirit of prophecy that I always apply in my family also. And that is, God says, you should never lay down, like he's doing it right now, that's laying down. You see that? No, it's okay. He's okay. He may be weak or tired. I'm, not, I'm just 
giving the example. This is laying down, okay? You should never lay down after a meal. In three hours after a meal, you should not lay down. Three hours after a meal, you should not lay down. Okay, this is God's rule. And that's what I follow in my home. So guess what happened with my Kevin when he was born? And I gave Carla the guidelines on how to breastfeed the baby. My queen. I told her, when the baby breastfeed, he will not go to sleep. Never. And they were never allowed to go to sleep after breastfeeding. Does that sound, does that sound like different? Nah, it is different. What are we going to follow? God's commands or the commandments of men? What does people say when a baby feeds? What do you do? <laughs> to sleep. What does God say? You should never lay down after a meal. Of course, for a baby, it's not three hours. He has a three-hour schedule. So how do you do it with a child? All right. Fathers, you are the one here. Pay attention to this. Mothers normally cannot see these things, but if you don't have a husband, you have to learn how to do it. Father should be the one in here. You observe your child when he's breastfeeding. And I know you will not have that problem because you would like to see your wife also, right? Then you observe how the child breastfeeds. And you see how much time he takes. Make sure the baby finish his plate. He finish his breast well. He needs to learn to finish his food and then come down on the table. Right? Since babyhood. And then you observe how much he sleeps when he sleeps. And then you have few days, only two or three days, so you can start calculating how much time and when you're going to do what you have to do. So with Kevin, my first, I started observing. First day, second day, three days. Observing how much he fed and how much he slept. And how he do it. My first baby, Kevin, he was a very sleepy boy. He would like to eat five minutes and go to sleep. Wake up. What the problem is? He wake up and he was hungry. Why? Because he didn't finish the food. He didn't finish the plate. He went to sleep before he could finish. He was a sleepy boy. So, my work to wake him up. I took the task. I will get a rock with water and put it and put it in the face. And he will wake up. Or I will blow in his face. Then he go back to the breast. Sometimes it was hard. But he has to finish his plate before he can go for the next step. So two hours and a half, let's see it. Two hours and a half, let's say he was eating approximately 40 minutes in the breastfeeding. He will take 40 minutes finishing one breast and then the next one. This is another principle we can talk about medically. Why is important? Finishing one breast and then go to the next one if he needed it. If he doesn't need it, then he doesn't have to go. But if he needed, finish one breast, then go for the next one. Finish eating. He will take 40 minutes. At the 40 minutes, he was awake and he did not want the breast anymore. I knew he was through. Right? So I knew he was a 40 minute. My queen says that sometimes even one hour. So let's say 40 minutes to one hour. That's what he needs. So what I'm saying is you pay attention. You cannot allow him to go through 20 minutes and you think that he's done. No, that's not true. Most likely, he's not done because he takes 40 minutes to an hour. So you pay attention what's going on. So he will finish around 40 minutes or an hour. And I knew he was done because he was awake and he said, I don't want the breast. He will refuse it. Okay? I know he ate what he needed. Next step. What is next? Sleeping? No. This is the father's time. Brothers and sisters, this is the most important time of your breastfeeding Time, not with the mother. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. What does Jesus want? The church to build up members so the church remains with the members? No. God is building the church so the members grew up to spend time with Him in heaven. Yes or not? So the next time after a feeding is the Father's time. Don't forget that, fathers. 
This is the most important time for you. Let's see it. So you have the 60 minutes sleep. I knew Kevin was a 60 minutes sleeper. So now he eats 40 minutes or an hour. I know he sleeps for 60 minutes. Guess what? I need to keep him awake. How many minutes? 50 minutes. That's what the time remains. It's a schedule of two and a half hours. So from one feeding to the next one should be two and a half hours. But during the two and a half hours, there are things that have to be done. First, eating. Physical needs first. God did it all the time in the story of Israel. He always supplied their spirit, the physical needs first. Then the spiritual one. Then the second time is the awaking time. This is the time for worship. This is the time to go for a walk with Father in nature. The most important time of breastfeeding. Do you think the sleeping time is important? It is important. It's the law of health. You need to rest properly. But it's not the most important one. The most important one is the awakening time. Now, put this in your mind. It's not going to be easy, parents. Why? Because you know that he sleeps 60 minutes. You know the schedule, right? You know that he eats certain time. And when the time is coming for the sleeping time, he may start feeling drowsy because he's tired. Looking at flowers and being having worship with you. And then he wants to go to sleep earlier. But guess what? You put him to sleep earlier, what's going to happen? He's going to wake up earlier, and he wants to eat earlier, and your whole schedule is going to be messed up. Principles we have to follow, fathers, as we follow this, is you have to make sure the awakening time is interesting. It's enjoyable. And that you spend time with the child, not let the child somewhere. <coughs> you see the point? Now, I'm not saying there may be times you can do that because you need to have to be doing something. But don't let Satan use the awakening time that you have the privilege to have. You see the point? If you don't use it, he is going to use it. So we have to use it. So in my home, I took charge of that. Now, you remember I told you that in Guyana, people ask me if Kevin never cried, right? Okay, let me explain to you. This is the way it is. I know that he has all this time, so I have all the time regulated. I put him in the breast. Do you think he will cry for that? No, he's happy. He's hungry. So he goes in the breast. He finished eating. Now he's fed. Do you think he will be angry? No, he's fed. He's happy. His belly is full. Now he goes with daddy. He likes daddy. My Kevin loves me. And he likes to be with me. So much that if I step in the house, he will stop breastfeeding to see me. That's how much my Kevin loves me. And my wife will have to say, go away. If not, he will not eat. He wants to see you and be with you. Okay. Then, I will spend the time with him in the waking time. And then I know he was getting sleepy, but the time was not yet. So, let's go and see another flower. Let's go and sing another song. Do whatever needs to be done, but keep him awake until the time is right. Then, I will wrap him. Why? Because it's very important to wrap children when they are sleeping. Make sure that they have the right temperature and the right clothes, cotton, so you can wrap him well and wrap him that he will be warm and not hot. You wrap him well with the, tie, the hands tied. Why? Because they will wake up and I can explain that later another time. It's important to wrap the children so they will not wake up. And then I will wrap him and I could see in his face a smile. I can still see my children, all of them smile when I will wrap them to go to sleep. And then I know I have the time. 60 minutes. At the end of the 60 minutes, I was there. Why? I make sure I was there at the 60 minutes time. 
because I will take him up. I knew I could see him just already moving because he's waking up. I know it's the time, right? I take him, I unwrap him, I kiss him, and I run to mama. Why? Because I know the next step is his physical need. He's hungry. And then I will pray on my walk to the mother, and I will say, thank you, Lord, for the food, with his hand for prayer. And I will put him in the breast. And then he will have the time with the church. If I was not there at the 60 minutes, and I was not careful as a father to be there and supply his need, I will be teaching him that the Father in heaven does not care for me. You see, fair parents, especially fathers, we have to be careful what we teach our children. And this applies since babyhood. One of the most important lessons in the breastfeeding of a child is the provision and the care of the Father in heaven. Can you see how many children today are lacking that lesson of the Father in heaven taking care of our needs? Can you see that? Brothers and sisters, we are not seeing and the picture in reality in the way God sees it. We need wisdom from above and we need it. We have the way of having it. God has promised, I will supply all your needs. And He said, I will instruct you and teach thee in the way we should go. And He has given us the Bible. He has given us the spirit of prophecy so we can read this book and apply it in our homes. Fathers, you have the greatest responsibility because Jesus is standing for the church and He will ask you the question at the end when He comes. Where is your children? And where is your wife? Because it's the same question, God the Father, as Jesus, all this time, right now, Jesus is doing the accountability before God the Father. This is my church, this is my church, this is my church. I am standing for her, I died for her, I will supply my church need. Husbands, we have to supply the needs of our homes and our wives. So we can reflect the character of God. Fathers, if you want, of course, I didn't finish with that, but anyhow, time is over. We have, of course, there, 5 o'clock in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, 12 12.30, 3 o'clock, and 5.30. You can change the schedule. We can talk later about how we change it. How do you know when to change the schedule? Brothers and sisters, do you know these things? Did we know, did we learn these things when our youth do you see real medical missionary work? The need that we have in our churches today? The lack of knowledge that we have. And as I told you before, I'm not perfect. I have committed mistakes myself, but that doesn't mean God's truth is not good. It is good, I've tested it, I have seen it in my home, in my, home, in my life, and it is good. All taste and see that the Lord is good. Especially parents, men, do you want the church of your home to be good and grow for the Lord? To have missionary children for the 11 hour? You want that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege you have given me to present this morning this beautiful topic. And you know that I enjoy it because I have received the blessings through this. I can see the blessings in my children, and I can see more and more as Enoch, the love of God, as I keep my children for you. Please forgive me, Lord, when I have not had the patience, or I have not represented you in the proper way to my children. And please, Lord, give us your Holy Spirit that we men will learn the things that we need to learn before it's too late. That when Jesus comes, we can say, Lord, this is the grace you have given us. The children and the wife, the church that you gave me. 
to reflect your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.